love and power and compassion and justice and miracle and in waiting. Save us because we are your people and because this is your world. Amen. I'm going to read from Matthew 22, starting at verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him along the Herodians, saying, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us, then, what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. They brought him a denarius, and Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. Shalom, Havarim. Hello, friends. I, I heard a story this week, and we are going to try to keep it somewhat light today. <laughs> um, I heard a story this week about a guy who intentionally didn't pay his taxes. And he went a number of years, thought he was getting away with it, but you know how this works. Uh, eventually, the IRS finds out, and they come knocking on his door. He gets called in for an audit. And nobody wants to be, you know, in the IRS office, nobody wants to be audited. He's sitting there, he's gloomy, he knows what he did, he's feeling like he's going to get, you know, a pretty hefty fine because of this. He's moping around the office as the IRS agent is going through all of his documentation. And the gentleman, the IRS agent, says to him, hey, you know, sir, Mr. Johnson, like, really, here at the IRS, we want you to pay your taxes with a smile. And all at once, Mr. Johnson looked up and said, that's such good news, because I was afraid you were going to want cash. Instead of paying with a smile, he, he thought you'd have to pay with cash. <laughs> All right, so death and taxes. Everybody knows the famous quote from uh, Franklin. Um, Franklin said something like, there's only two things in life that you can count on. That is death and taxes. And today we're going to talk mostly about the taxes part. Matthew does actually talk about both death and taxes. He is consistent in presenting what Franklin saw many years later. But the thing about this passage is I don't really think this is about taxes. Uh, yeah, taxes is kind of the main question of, of the day, but really this is about something bigger. This is about the sovereignty of God. So what we're going to do is we're going to slow down. We're going to look at the context of this passage. Uh, we're going to talk about taxes a little bit, even though it's not really the point of this passage. And we're going to try to understand just what's going on in this interchange between Jesus and the Pharisees and the Herodians. All right, you think we can handle that? Sure, you're full of energy and ready to go. <laughs> All right, so the thing that we want to do anytime we are looking at a difficult passage is that we want to start with some context. Context matters. If you lift a certain passage out of context, you can make it mean about anything you want it to mean. But if we want to get to the deeper level, you really have to continue to do the work and understand what's going on. So if we turn back just one page in our Bibles, we go to the previous chapter before Jesus has this interaction with these individuals, we find a number of very familiar stories. When Jesus is approached by these men, it is during Holy Week of his last 
week here on earth. So you go back to Holy Week and you find that time when Jesus goes into Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday. He's riding a donkey. He's, he's uh, waving to the people and they're waving back with the palm branches. They yell things out to him. They say, Hosanna to the Lord in the highest. Save us, Jesus. And he rides that donkey. And I like to think, at least the way Matthew tells the story, that he rides that donkey right up to the temple. And he goes to the temple gate. He doesn't take the donkey in, but gets off the donkey. And he goes right in, and he sees that the temple is dirty, so he gets out his mop and his gloves, and he starts to cleanse it. All right. <laughs> Not that kind of cleansing of the temple. He goes in, and he starts to overturn the money changers' tables. He drives them out. He says, you have made my father's house into a den of thieves. So all of that is taking place just one chapter before our text for this morning. Then we have a couple of parables in between. And as often is the case, when Jesus tells these parables, the religious leaders, they don't turn out looking too good. So you can imagine that they decide that they want to do something about Jesus. They want to discredit him. They want to get him out of there. They want to regain some of the power themselves. So they get together, the Pharisees and the Herodians. The Herodians would have, been, um, would have been faithful to King Herod, who was kind of a puppet king for the Roman Empire. So the Herodians and the Pharisees come together. These are odd couple. And they begin having this discussion about how they can discredit Jesus. And they decide they're going to send their disciples to Jesus. I don't know why the Pharisees don't go themselves. They send their disciples to Jesus. And that's where our text picks up. Now, in this passage, we are told very directly a quote from Admiral Akbar from Return of the Jedi. <laughs> Anybody know who Admiral Akbar is? Some of you giggle. All right, what, what does he say? Trap. It's a trap. <laughs> it's a trap. It's a trap. Like it says multiple times in this passage, this is a trap. Like, very well know going into this experience that these people are not there because they actually care what Jesus thinks. They're there because they want to trap him. They're going to ask him a question. They come up with a plan, and if Jesus answers it, they're going to trap him and discredit him. Again, can't say this enough. They have no care whatsoever what Jesus answers as long as they can get rid of this guy, show him the door. So it makes me think about a number of different kinds of questions. Like, why are we asking questions? And I've touched on these before. Sometimes we ask questions for clarification. So some of you are drinking coffee out there right now. Roger, you made a pot of coffee this morning. Was that regular or decaf? Regular. It was regular. Okay, that was a question for clarification. I needed to know which kind that was. Sometimes you ask questions to fill in missing information. Oh, oh I was going to go see that new movie today. What time does that start? Oh, you could tell me the answer if you knew it. I'm filling in missing information. Sometimes we're asking questions for education. Um, I need to calculate the, <laughs> the volume of a cylinder. Okay, what is the formula for calculating the volume of a cylinder? Go, Lois. No. <laughs> Making eye contact with the pastor is always dangerous. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> um, then there's also, do you know people that do this last one, like ask questions to show how much they know? Like you're in a conference or something and they have like Q&A time or in a classroom setting and that one person always stands up and says, all right, well, I really appreciate your presentation today, but can you kind of help me understand like how that goes along with Aristotle's theory on this? And like, like they're dropping names and stuff like that. Nobody else has ever experienced that. Okay. <laughs> Dwayne has. It's because it was you that was asking. <laughs> how Aristotelian of the... No. Okay, these are kinds of questions that we've probably all experienced. But far too often, I think, we get this kind right here. The kind of question that's a, a drawing of a line in the dirt. And we're trying to call people out and ask the question, are you with us or are you against us? Are you on our side or their side? For instance, I've learned that this is a very contentious issue. Are you pro-cilantro or anti-cilantro? <laughs> yeah, some people, I guess you're... You do, oh, man. I'm a mandatory reporter, and if I feel... <laughs> okay, so 
I guess there's like a gene that you're born with. Some people taste cilantro differently. Um, they taste, it tastes like soap to them. I don't know. I, I personally, I'm pro cilantro. Um, I had a couple other examples. Uh, oh, are you pro time change or anti time change? Mm, I see some anti time change. Okay, pro um, Ford or Chevy? Ford. Ford. Yes, right. Ford. <laughs> Nissan. <laughs> We, these, these are real, this is meant to be like draw the line in the dirt. Which side are you on? Now, don't answer this one. Um, that's all for fun. Um, are you liberal or conservative? Are you Democrat or Republican? Did you vote for my guy or the other guy? Um, did you? And then I get this one here, and this is one that bothers me. Are you pro-Israel? I'm like, well, well, what does that even, what does that mean? Like, I don't want to see Israelis suffer and die. But I also don't want to see Palestinians suffer and die. I don't want to see bombing in Israel. I don't want to see bombing in the Gaza Strip. But people don't give you that room for, ne for nuance. What do they do? They say, are you pro-Israel? Well, if you're not, well, then you must be pro-Hamas. <laughs> no, that's, that's not the only option. We don't allow room for nuance. And that's exactly what is going on here in our story today. These Herodians and Pharisees' disciples come to Jesus, and they're asking that kind of question right there. They want Jesus to pick a side, to show what he really believes, and they're not leaving any room for nuance. So they come up to Jesus, and they ask him a question. Uh, I have it here on the screen. They ask the question, tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Now, I have that part highlighted there, underlined and in bold, because this is a different kind of tax than what we're used to. Like, I started thinking, you know, we pay income tax, we pay property tax, we pay sales tax. Like, we're, we're, we're really taxed, right? <laughs> you could say amen, right? This is not like that. This is the imperial tax that the Roman government charged the people that they had overtaken, if they came into your city and they occupied your territory, you were to pay the imperial tax for the luxury of being Roman, for the protection of the Roman army. Imagine, if you will, that Canada, and I noticed it was one of the green countries on Dwayne's map, if Canada invaded the United States and they sent the Mounties down here to Stanton to patrol the streets of Stanton. Well, first of all, It'd be kind of cool to see them walking around in those Mountie uniforms. But not only did they come here to Stanton to patrol our city, they charged us for doing it. Like, that's what's going on here in this case. Only we have a pretty good relationship with Canada. The Romans and the Israelites really didn't get along. So the enemy comes in and charges them to have the luxury of their soldiers in that city. This was not a popular tax. But notice, Jesus only has two answers that he can give them. Um, is it right to pay this tax or not? This is a yes or no question. Draw the line in the sand. But there is no right answer, because if Jesus says, yes, you should pay the tax, he's going to be labeled as a Herodian. He's going to be labeled as a sympathizer of the Roman government. And all those people that were waving their palm branches, yelling Hosanna in the highest a couple of days earlier are now going to say, wait, well, maybe this isn't the king we thought he was going to be. If he says, no, you should not pay the imperial tax, he becomes an instigator, a rabble rouser. He becomes labeled as an insurrectionist and will probably be arrested for that and put to death, which happened anyway. But either way, Jesus is here. He's what? He's in a trap. He knows that he cannot simply give a yes or no answer. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he asks them a question. He says, can you give me a coin, a specific coin, the coin that's used to pay your imperial tax? And Jesus knew very well that that coin would have been a denarius. This is an ancient Roman denarius. Um, and actually, just a side note, anybody here speak some Spanish? Um, I learned this week that the word for money in Spanish is dinero. And it comes from the word for denarius. Yeah, I learn something new every day. It has nothing to do with the sermon, but, you know. 
Jesus asks for a denarius, and he asks them whose image and whose inscription is on the denarius. They don't have to think about it. They know. They probably don't even have to look. They say, well, it's Caesar's, of course. And Jesus says, render under Caesar what is Caesar's, and give unto God what is God's. And it says the people left there, like, confused, and, like, they realized that they just got it handed to them. Like, they just got beat. And, and I start to think about, it, like, well, well why? <laughs> why is that such a good response? Now, what we traditionally see, the way this is traditionally interpreted, is that Jesus is providing us with two kingdom kind of situation here. This is traditional Lutheranism, come, going back to Martin Luther, the reformer. So Luther said that there are kingdoms of this world and there is kingdoms of the kingdom of God. And they exist side by side. And in the kingdom of the world, you pay your taxes. You go to work. You're a good civil servant. You do what you need to do to get along with other people. That's not a bad thing. In the kingdom of God, you offer your praises, your worship, um, perhaps a tithe to God and the church. And I get why Luther says this, but also would point out that those, that sort of thinking allows you to be able to do something for the kingdoms of this world that would disagree with the kingdom of God. And I hate to always go this way, I'm going to anyway. Um, this is what allows good Lutheran soldiers to fight for Hitler during World War II, because what you're doing there is you're fighting for a kingdom of this world. And there's no con co cognitive dissonance between that and the kingdom of God. I'm doing this as a good kingdom of this earth, and I'm going to go and worship God the next day. So I don't think that that's really exactly what's going on in this story. Because we have these ideas, these new concepts of secular and sacred that just wouldn't have worked in Jesus' day. They had no concept of what secularity was. Everything was about God are all around us, God's being, God's with us. So let's re-step through this, this whole scenario. Jesus asked the people for a coin, a specific coin, a coin to pay the tax at the temple. They give him a denarius. He asks whose image is on that. We know that is Caesar's. And he asks whose inscription is on that. Well, the inscription says on that, I'm sure you can read it. <laughs> The inscription says, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. The moment that they read that, they seem to realize something is off. Because let's re retrace the entire week of what just happened. We know Jesus rode into town on the donkey. He went to the temple and cleansed it. What did he overthrow? The money changers table. Well, why is there a money changers table in the temple to start with? Because you can't take this coin into the temple. You can't pay your temple tax with an image of Caesar on a, with an a inscription that says Tiberius Caesar is divine or the son of the divine. This right here is idolatrous to a Jewish person. If we go back to what we talked about last week, we looked at the story of the golden calf. And we talked about Exodus 20, the, the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no engraven image of anything on earth, above earth, below earth, in the water. No good Jewish person would have a Roman imperial coin in their pocket. So when they approach Jesus, he doesn't simply give them a yes or no answer. He asks them to show him a coin. And in doing so, in producing that, and everybody knowing who's on that coin, this coin that bears the image of Caesar, that says that he is divine, the divine son, in doing that, he's exposing them and their idolatry. And that's why they go away thinking, oh, what did I just do? You see, each one of those people that approached Jesus that day, the Herodians, the Pharisees, they all come from the same religious background. They were what? They were Jewish. And every good Jew would know the scriptures better than I'm sure most of us do. And they would know that Psalm 24, verse 1, says things like this. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. So when he asks that question, you know, when he says to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's, how much is left for Caesar after Everything in the world is gone. 
Like there's no, no, it's all, it's all God's. And not only that, you know that silver that the coin's made out of? Guess who made the silver? Well, that's, that's too, <laughs> is from God. Let's take it one step further. If having someone's image on the coin suggests that they are the owner of that coin, well, there's something else that is created in the image of God, isn't there? Genesis 1, verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And that's why I say this whole passage, this isn't about taxes. This is about remembering Everything that we have, even who we are, belongs to God, not to Caesar. And I think he doesn't really answer the question, should we pay taxes or not? What he says is, no, make sure that you're giving your all to God. But here's the thing. I know that everybody here right now, you you came today because you wanted to know, should we be paying taxes? You're like... (laughs) You're like, all right, I just want my pastor to say I don't need to pay taxes, then I can go home and, you know, <laughs> keep that money. Um, if that's what you're hoping for today, I'm going to give you a couple of different interpretations, but you're not going to get a definitive answer, other than to say, I pay my taxes. And yeah, that's what's going on video right now. They're hearing out in the world. Um, I pay my taxes. That's, that's the law. That's what we're supposed to do. Um, I don't pay any more than I have to. You know, it's not like, you know, the, the IRS calls up and they, they give me my, my income tax bill. And I'm like, you know what? Let's round that up. You, know, <laughs> you deserve a tip. <laughs> I guess, uh, IRS is the only one that doesn't ask for a tip these days, right? <laughs> Soon it's coming. They're going to have that, that place where you can round up and, and donate. You know, do you want to give 10% to your IRS agent? No. Like, I don't give any more than I need to, but I'm legally required to give some money to the IRS. So I do so. And one of the things that we do here at this church is, I don't know, I I could go back and forth. Sometimes it feels right, sometimes it feels wrong. But one thing that I would note is that we own two properties, rental properties. One is used right now for ministry, and the other one is used only as an income for the church. Now, as a 501c3 organization, we could get out of paying property taxes on those properties. But we have chosen not to. We continue to pay property tax in part because we know where property taxes go. What do the property taxes pay for? Casey gave us some good examples earlier. Well, you were saying things like roads. Help you build roads. roads. Um, They also pay a certain salary. Teachers' salary come from taxes. Schools are paid for from our property taxes. So as a church, we continue to contribute because we think that money is going to good places. Is it abused a little bit? Maybe. (laughs) Yeah, of course it is. It's money, right? But we've chosen to do that anyway, to continue to pay those property taxes, even though it might not be required of us. Now, we in the Mennonite tradition also have a history of having war tax resistors. This is the way that people will often go about doing this. If, um, because out of conscience, if you cannot contribute to the cost that's associated with going overseas and participating in war, um, what's often published is the amount of a, the government's spending that goes toward warfare. And if people find that amount out, they will often deduct that amount from the taxes that they give to the U- United States government and then put that toward a nonprofit organization. Every time you do that, you will be... Um, the IRS will inquire about that money. They want that money. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, most people don't get arrested for doing that. I also know that this is not simply a liberal hippie thing. I know people that, out of conscious sake, don't give a certain amount of their taxes to the government because they can't affiliate themselves or, or imagine that they're contributing toward that area um, of the government spending. And so people, and I don't necessarily agree with all of this, but just to give you examples that it's not liberal or progressive, I know people that withhold amount of money that would go toward Planned Parenthood and people that withhold amount of money that would go toward funding the police force. So people withhold these funds, risking themselves getting arrested and paying huge fines out of conscious sake. And even though I might not always agree with why that person is withholding their money, I respect that, that decision because I know that it's a, something that they thought about. You don't just make that decision willy-nilly, which is a good theological phrase right there. What I really respect are the people that do a very legal way of not paying your taxes. 
and that is living below the poverty line. If your income is so far below the, the poverty line that um, you don't make a certain amount, you don't have to pay taxes. So I know people that say that they can't contribute to the government spending in various ways out of conscience, and they make the decision to make less than the poverty level just so that they don't have to pay taxes. And I think that's a huge lifestyle commitment, a huge commitment to an ideal. And I just want to say I respect that, even though at times maybe I don't agree with the reason why they're doing it. Anybody that would make such a big decision that would cost them so much personally, I think I have to respect that. So we think about all this together then, and I think I can try to tie it together as the sermon concludes. You know, when we think about this question about taxes, this was never a question about whether or not we pay money to the government. Again, in Jesus' day, their understanding of the, temp the, the tax, the imperial tax, was vastly different than anything that we pay today. But the point is still there. The point is to slow down and ask yourself questions about the stuff that's burning holes in our pockets, about this way of life that we are living. And asking questions, is this something we can do out of consciousness? Or do we have to make serious changes that may affect our life, our way of living, our well-being? I respect people that make that decision, even if I don't always agree with what they decide. There is a legal way to make those decisions. So taxes, this sermon for today, it's really not about money. It's about the sovereignty of God. Who do we ultimately think is in charge? Who do we ultimately say is Lord? Is Jesus Lord over, over our lives? Is he Lord over our finances? Is he Lord over all or not? I believe that the psalmist was right. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And that means that sometimes we just need to slow down and ask how we are using the things that God has put us in charge of. Please join me in prayer. God, we thank you for challenging passages that call us to think, to dig deeper, to learn more, and at times to make difficult decisions. And Lord, it's so easy sometimes to draw lines in the earth to say, say yes or no, this or that, cilantro or no cilantro. But Lord, when we get right down to it, the world isn't always that easy. It requires nuance. It requires understanding. It requires context. So help us, God, to do the difficult work, to be good stewards of the things that we've been given. That includes the money that is in our pockets and in our bank accounts. Help us, Lord, to do so in a way that is pleasing unto you, in a way that glorifies you and your kingdom. May your kingdom come, may your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, nobody hit me with tomatoes or left during that sermon. That was good. Uh, this brings us to the time of our service for the sharing of praises and